Good morning. We're uh, bringing Colonel Dorian up right now. In the meantime, I just wanted to alert you to tomorrow, uh, our normal off-camera press briefing, uh, normally conducted over next door in the press office. We're going to do here tomorrow, still off-camera, but uh, to allow us to use the screens. We're going to be replaying the press conference held in the Pentagon press briefing room on 9-11. It's about 17 minutes long. Uh, you'll recognize a lot of familiar faces in it. Uh, um, and it's uh, kind of an interesting, uh, fitting tribute to what happened on 9-11 and, and the efforts of a lot of uh, people in your press corps who helped to tell the story of that day. Um, and uh, a rather surreal thing to see a press conference being held from inside a burning building. Uh, so we're going to replay that tape tomorrow uh, at 1130 as part of our normal press gaggle. Um, John, you look great. It is great to see you there. Uh, I just want to make sure we can hear you and you can hear us. Loud and clear, Lima Charlie. Well, uh, welcome to you and uh, appreciate your service in uh, raising your hand to go take on the, the, the challenge of being the spokesperson for Operation Inherent Resolve. And um, we look forward to, to the first of what I know will be many uh, informative briefs from you. And uh, we'll, without any hesitation or ado, we'll turn it over to you. Well, Jeff, thanks very much. Good morning, Pentagon Press Corps. I'm Colonel uh, John Dorian. Uh, although I've spoken with many of you individually uh, to address a lot of operational events since I've gotten here, it's my first time to speak to you as a group. I hope that I can ably follow my esteemed colleagues, Chris Garver and Steve Warren, who were most generous with their time and patiently answered my many questions as I prepared for this great job. I'll start with some prepared remarks, and then I'll be delighted to take your questions. It's been an eventful few weeks since Lieutenant General Steve Townsend took command of Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. The general started his command by charging our coalition forces to fulfill his intent in two key areas, to continue the attack against Daesh and sustain the considerable momentum built by the three corps and the coalition joint team that served here before our arrival. It's been quite a busy three weeks and an eventful three weeks since then, marked by continued progress in shaping and clearing operations in Iraq, continued reduction in Daesh's ability to infiltrate, infiltrate fighters into and out of northern Syria, and sustained pressure on Daesh's command and control, including attacks against Daesh leadership figures, especially in and around Mosul. Now I'd like to give you an operational overview starting in Iraq and then moving into Syria. Please pull up the map. East of Mosul at star number one, coalition forces supported Peshmerga forces conducting Operation Evergreen II, which was designed to seize and control the key terrain near the Guerra River Bridge and the Great Zab River. The operation was executed with 1,500 to 2,000 Peshmerga with support from coalition and artillery strikes. Of note, the coalition used helicopters to lift the artillery into position and then exfiltrated the guns when the operation was complete. The firing solutions this offered provided maximum flexibility for the commander on the ground and the entire operation was conducted uh, from August 14th to 16th. It took less than 48 hours to achieve its primary goals. The operation also liberated 12 villages, a lot of people who are living under miserable conditions under Daesh. At star number two, two ISF and CTS forces added Kiara to the list of cities liberated from Daesh. And in the last two weeks alone, the ISF liberated an additional six villages in the area. The significance of these liberation battles is that the Iraqi security forces continue to gain control of key terrain and lines of communication, while Daesh continue to lose freedom of movement and the resources that come from controlling terrain. Kiara West Airfield has been cleared and efforts are underway to develop this area to support upcoming operations to liberate Mosul. As my predecessors discussed, this area will be important as a stepping stone and staging area for Iraqi security forces in the interest of operational security and protection of our force there. 
we're going to be a little bit limited today in what details we're able to offer. Moving north into Syria, near Star 3. After taking Gerabalus with his partnered forces, Turkey has announced that they'll clear the remaining, uh, that they've cleared the remaining border region from further infiltration by Daesh. This terrain was important as an infiltration route into and out of the region. ISIL's losing freedom of movement in this area improves security in Europe and around the world and severely impacts Daesh's ability to reinforce fighters in Syria and Iraq. ISIL is an adaptive and determined enemy, and the coalition will continue to support Turkey as our NATO ally and their partner forces as they continue to strengthen their lines and secure that border. The coalition will also continue working with our SDF partners in Syria to assure the latest progress continues to build momentum for a lasting defeat of Daesh in the region. This latest progress, coupled with continuous airstrikes to dismantle Daesh command and control, financing and resupply routes, set conditions for the eventual liberation of Raqqa, the city that Daesh consider their capital. Part of setting those conditions is the continued work to assure that all anti-Daesh forces operating in Syria have the lines of coordination and deconflict operations in what has become a very crowded battle space. Unity of focus on ISIL over the coming days and weeks is imperative. Our allies, our coalition members, and all of our partners have a unifying interest in defeating Daesh. We believe the important, the improved coordination of armed activities in northern Syria will improve the safety of our forces. As you all know, Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve is a coalition of many nations unified to defeat Daesh, and I'd like to highlight the accomplishments of some of our allies as they support the Iraqi security forces drive toward Mosul. As you know, our training partners from Australia, New Zealand, Spain, and Italy, and others are working hard to prepare Iraqi security forces. Indeed, right now as we speak, there are 6,500 ISF in training, more than, more than at any one time during the campaign here. That's not just Army forces for the liberation of Mosul, that's also wide area security forces, the police that will be needed as Daesh continue to lose control of territory and further devolve into terrorist and insurgent tactics. The United Kingdom recently announced the embarkation of the destroyer HMS Daring to the Persian Gulf, where she will provide security for our carrier-based flight operations. In addition, the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle will also be joining the mission in the near future and will add significant air capability as we continue shaping operations and taking the fight against Daesh. Also, I wanted to share some of the work that's being done to go over, to go after Daesh leadership figures. Over the past 60 days, coalition precision airstrikes have targeted and struck more than a dozen ISIL leaders in Mosul alone. These strikes have a disruptive effect on enemy command and control, which is important in setting conditions for Mosul's liberation. What we're talking about here is strikes against military commanders, safe houses, weapons facilitators, vehicle-borne IED attack coordinators, security commanders, and their operations and communication leadership. Finally, you all saw the announcement that we took a precision strike against Abu Muhammad al-Adnani last week. Coali coalition forces had been training, track him for a long time, knowing it was important to remove him from his role as ISIL's senior plotter for external terror attacks. Adnani was head of ISIL's Emni Directorate, responsible for spying, internal messaging, and discipline, as well as planning and directing the murder of innocent men, women, and children in terror, terror attacks around the world. We're still assessing the results of that strike. It's a rigorous process of intelligence gathering and analysis before we confirm the strike had its desired effect. 
when the professionals have gone through the relevant intel intelligence and that process is completed, we will inform you at once. With that, I'll open it up for your questions. All right, we'll start with Lita Baldor from Associated Press. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for continuing this uh, tradition. Um, one quick follow-up on Adnani. Can you say at least um, whether the military is reasonably certain that he is dead or fairly certain uh, at this point, considering what's going on? And then I, I have a, a question about Mosul. Lita, thanks for that question. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to speculate. I think we'll stay where we are now. Uh, the intelligence professionals are going through reams of intelligence to make sure that uh, that we've got our man and we'll inform you once we have more information okay um on mosul um lieutenant general townsend has apparently said that he expects the um, campaign into mosul to begin within the next month um is that the latest assessment and at, if so is kiara west ready for a larger infusion of U.S. and Iraqi forces, when do you expect um, a greater number of, of uh, forces to go into Kiara West, and isn't that sort of a key to the um, start of the Mosul campaign? As, as I've discussed this with General Townsend, what he said is the key. This is an Iraqi-driven uh, process, but what he said is the key is that the Iraqi security forces have enough forces and uh, the right kind of forces and the right training in place so that they can get uh, um, ready for that liberation battle. In addition to the liberation battle, they have to get enough forces for the hold force that would follow in after the liberation. So that's really the long pole in the tent timeline-wise. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi has come out and said that uh, he would like to get this done within the year. And we are going to be at the Iraqi Security Forces side and uh, be there to try to help pursue that. But again, didn't, uh, didn't he not say that he expects it to begin within the next month? The, you know, we're, we're really, uh, what we're talking about here is meeting the Iraqi timeline. So if you're going to get something done by the end of the year, this is a very tough battle. The, uh, the Mosul liberation battle, Mosul is five to six times as large as Ramadi in both area and uh, in the number of people that are there. So there are going to be a lot of planning considerations and a lot of troops that have to be trained in order to do that. Uh, we expect a very tough fight because uh, the, uh, the uh, Daesh have been in that area for more than two years. So they've had a chance to build intricate defenses. So we're going to try to meet the Iraqi timeline. I'm, I'm sorry, let me just give this one last shot. Um, so are you saying Lieutenant General Tarzan does not believe it will start within the next month, or he does believe it could start? I'm not saying finish or whatever. I'm just saying that the actual campaign, if he believes that they, the Iraqis, as well as the coalition, will be ready to begin within the next month. It sounds like he has said that. I want to make sure that that's either accurate or inaccurate. Yeah. You know what, Lita, I, I think I'm going to have to leave, leave it with you with we're going to meet the Iraqi timeline. Okay. Uh, next to Tara Kopp with Stars and Stripes. Hi, Colonel uh, Tara Kopp. Uh, just to follow on with Lita's questioning, um, you know, the journal article today explicitly said starting in a month. and. Uh, is, is General Townsend backing off of those comments? Um, and then on the, just the sheer numbers of trained Iraqis, you said there are 6,500 in training right now. With the is Iraqi time frame to get this kicked off in a month? And if so, is that even possible if you still have needed forces going through the training cycle? Yeah, we, we expect the Iraqi security forces to be ready to take on this liberation battle. So we do believe that uh, we're more or less on plan, but ultimately, you know, if the, uh, the desire is to try to get it done around the end of the year, um, we're going to have to start soon. I would shy, you know, from my perspective, 
I, uh, I really don't want to put it on a timeline that uh, um, is, is any more clear than we're going to meet the Iraqi timeline. And is the Iraqi timeline to get it started in a month? <laughs> I think I'll have to defer to the Iraqis on that. Uh, one numbers question for you. Um, earlier this year, uh, the numbers of ISIS fighters we were told were in Mosul was roughly 1,000 to 2,000, but these most recent numbers seem to be considerably higher than that. Um, have you seen more ISIS fighters flowing into Mosul, or ha uh, is this just having better visibility? Why the jump in numbers? No, ISIL, ISIL has had a chance, uh, you know, to build up intricate defenses. They've had a chance to use rat lines to get a lot of people into and out of the area. A lot of that has been curtailed uh, very significantly since, uh, you know, the last several months because uh, while the Iraqi security forces are training and getting ready and doing shaping operations in and around Mosul, what we've done is we've hammered uh, Dash targets with airstrikes and strikes from artillery and and HIMARS. So a lot of that activity has been curtailed, but uh, they have uh, a chance to get a lot of forces in, and now uh, they're sort of pinned down there. What we expect to shape up when the liberation battle starts is that the city will be largely enveloped, and then the Iraqis will move in on a timeline of their choosing. Okay, next to uh, Idris Ali with Reuters. Uh, thanks. Um, so the same report that Lita and Tara mentioned, there was a bit about Raqqa and how the push had been put on hold because there was tension between Turkey and the United States. Has the push for Raqqa been put on hold, um, and is it for that reason? Well, what's happened in uh, northern Syria most recently, what, you know, the Turkish military moving in there and then sealing off the entire border and building a buffer zone, that's been extraordinarily helpful and a, a, a real setback for Daesh. So we're now working with the Turkish military uh, and we're working with our SDF partners to come up with uh, the game plan for the way ahead here. Um, you know, there was some, uh, some challenges between the SDF and the Turkish military for uh, some period of time. We're very Glad to see that uh, it's been relatively peaceful between those two. Um, so we've opened lines of communication and coordination to make sure that we de-conflict the things that are going on there. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is set conditions where every armed uh, entity uh, that wants to work with us to fight Daesh uh, can do so, but in a manner where it's a coordinated effort and everyone can do so safely. Uh, hold on the push for Raqqa, because that's what General Towson um, said. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the status of the effort against Raqqa is planning continues, as do a tremendous number of shaping operations. A lot of the things that we've talked about with uh, the, uh, the airstrikes um, and strikes in general, uh, the further uh, reduction in freedom of movement for Daesh fighters, all that work continues at pace, all of it. How many, um, what's the estimate of ISIS fighters in, in Raqqa and Mosul, the latest one? Mm. Well, in, uh, in Mosul, we think it's anywhere from uh, 3,000 to 4,500. And in, uh, in Raqqa, we think somewhere on the order of 1,000. But... These are squishy figures, and, you know, it's very difficult to tell. One of the dynamics with that is there are some hardcore fighters. There are people that are not as committed to the fight. There are people that are tolerant, and then there are people that uh, wish they weren't there. So it's very difficult to give you a very accurate estimate, and I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why the numbers uh, tend to fluctuate here. Uh, next, we'll go to Kasim Maleri with Anadolu News Agency. Hi, Colonel. Um, thanks for doing this. The Turkish Defense Minister today, after his meeting with Secretary Carter, said that Turkey would like to support the operation in Raqqa. And then he also said that he conveyed to the Secretary that uh, Turkey will not accept uh, PYD and YPG forces 
uh, trying to exploit the Raqqa operation in order to make some territorial gains in northern Syria. And he said the uh, Free Syrian Army should take role in Raqqa operation. What would be your assessment of these comments? Uh, I, I have seen those comments. What I would say is the Turkish military's actions in northern uh, Syria have been extraordinarily helpful in searing off, sealing off that border. And we do uh, welcome their support and involvement. It's been uh, very, very helpful to what uh, I think the entire coalition hopes to do in defeating Daesh and giving them a lasting defeat. Now, we will continue to work with our SDF partners, but one of the key elements of this coordination is we want to make sure that uh, we deconflict all of our actions and make sure that uh, uh, this is done in a manner that doesn't result in any kind of problems or hostilities between our partners. That there is a, some sort of coordination which deconflicts the Turkish military with the PYD forces. What type of a coordination is this? Turkish, Turkish military and Turkish authorities are uh, insistently denying that there is no coordination between Turkish military and the SDF or PYD elements. You're correct. The coordination is uh, with the coalition and the Turkish military. We talk to them every day uh, to pursue our mutual interest in defeating Daesh. Likewise, the coalition does continue to work with the SDF, um, and we will, you know, a part of our role is to keep these groups that, that uh, have different interests um, in, a, in a channel where their coordination and communication with us, we can assure that there's not going to be a situation that results in uh, an unsafe battle space because it is a crowded battle space. Everyone agrees that Dash has to be defeated. So very important piece of work. Can we say that you, <clears throat> you would welcome Turkish backed Free Syrian Army forces to come down to take Raqqa or to, to, to join the Raqqa operation? Uh, all those discussions are really working at a diplomatic level much higher than our operational role here. But we do seek to have great partnerships with our ally, Turkey, and with the coalition members and with our other partners. So it, it would probably be well above my pay grade to uh, try to broker anything with, with uh, at that level. This is, this is operational level. What you're talking about is a political level. Last question, uh, Colonel. Turkish military and uh, Free Syrian Army is now moving toward al Bab. Uh, what would be your reaction to that? Uh, would you welcome that, that movement? Yeah, what, what uh, I'm unaware of those reports. I haven't seen that, but, um, you know, what, what we're about is keeping all of the groups um, fighting Daesh. That is the goal, and, you know, I, I think I probably just should leave it at that. I'm not aware of that report. Thank you. Okay, next uh, to Gordon Lubold of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, John, um, thanks. Uh, different question is, and I may have missed it at the top, but my understanding is that uh, uh, as many as 400 new troops arrived in Iraq over the weekend, and could you kind of uh, maybe expand on, if you already mentioned it, um, what they're doing and where they're going and what we should know? Hmm. I, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure it's 400 over the weekend, Gordon. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's correct. I'd have to check that in order to uh, verify its accuracy. I can tell you that there's a tremendous amount of work doing, uh, going on for training. There's a tremendous amount of work going on to set conditions, including the logistics tail that would be required in order to go after Mosul. Um, and then we continue to hammer the enemy with strikes, including both uh, artillery and airstrikes. Can you tell me what the current number of the public number of boots on the ground um, in Iraq now versus what's uh, currently authorized? Yep, uh, the the public number is 4460, and the number authorized is 4640, I believe. Was it? Was it? 
4460 last week. Do you know? I don't. I'd have to check that. <clears throat> okay. Well, Anything else? I'm out. At that time. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, John. We lost you about the last 15 seconds. If you could just repeat. Yep. We were about 4,000 at that time. You were 4,000 a week ago? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, next uh, to uh, Tolga Tanis of Hurriyet. Uh, hi, Colonel. Uh, thanks. I have a question on Raqqa and another question on Mosul, if I may. Uh, first of all, uh, you used the term of buffer zone after the, the Turkish operation who cleared this ISIS forces from this uh, border area. Who will protect that buffer zone? Do you think that FSA forces are enough to uh, provide the protection, this kind of buffer zone, or Turkish uh, military will take a role in this? Well, this, this, uh, the action to, to create that space along the Turkish border was extraordinarily helpful uh, in reducing Daesh influence and ability to come into and out of that area. The, the manner in which that uh, area is held, I think is probably one of the many planning points that, you know, the coalition will continue to work with the Turkish military to determine. So I don't know is the short answer, but it is an important task and it is important that that area be held because holding it reduces Daesh freedom of movement and makes things extraordinarily difficult for them. Do you have an estimate about the FSA forces on the ground in this pocket, and do you have any contact with one of these groups? I would have to get back to you on that one. So, uh, there is a Turkish presence in Bashika. Uh, about this upcoming operation in Mosul, do you have any expectation from the Turkish forces in Bashika? You know what, as far as the, the Turkish role, I, I would have to have to check and see what the role would be. Uh, I do know that coalition forces have been extraordinarily uh, busy setting conditions. Uh, the Iraqi security forces have worked to envelop the city. We've continued to do strikes, air strikes. We've continued to do training. Again, 6,500 forces um, are in the training pipeline now. Some of those forces are being refit going back through training after having worked in the liberation battles down in Ramadi and along the Euphrates River Valley. So, you know, it, it, there is a tremendous amount of work to be done, but off the top of my head, I would have to double check on the Turkish role. We can get back to you on that. Just to clarify, Colonel, the last one. The, so far, the Turkish presence in, in Bashika wasn't coordinated with the coalition efforts. Is this the case? Is, is this still the case? Uh, are they still out of the coalition efforts in Bashika? You know what, I, I believe this is an area of an ongoing political discussion between uh, Turkey and Iraq, and that, that's being worked at political level, not, um, not something that, uh, you know, I, I would be in a position that I could discuss with you today. Next to Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hey, John, um, can you confirm that the precise quotes in the Wall Street Journal article are accurate? Um, I, I don't have that article before me, so, uh, you know, help me, Maria. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second while I look it up, but, um, and I'll read them to you. Uh, but secondly, I have another question uh, regarding uh, the, um, the training of these uh, combat forces for Mosul. You said that's pretty much done. How many forces have been trained, and how many uh, support or hold forces, as you refer to them, need to be trained? Um, we expect between 8 and 12 brigades to be involved in the uh, liberation of Mosul and a like number of hold forces that would come in behind. Now, these are security forces, and they're also village uh, forces. So uh, very important to do the liberation battle. Usually you like to have a, a you know, anywhere from um, um, 3 to 1 to 5 to 1 uh, advantage. And then uh, for the hold force, uh, that number is still being determined, and we're working with the Iraqi security forces to just nail that piece of it down. And now that I have the article in front of me, if, if you don't mind, 
Um, in, the, in the article, he said, when he described the fight for Mosul, he said, it was, we're preparing for a hard fight, a long, difficult fight. Uh, he said, really, it's a siege that I'm talking about here. Um, and he predicted that about a third of them, uh, the Daesh fighters, the 3,000 to 4,500 that you mentioned, are, quote, the hardest core fighters who will essentially die in place. While, and then, it's paraphrasing here, that others will maybe take off and run. Um, but the key line that has been come up here today has been about uh, the uh, October timeline. And he, the, the article says, the general predicted the move on Mosul would begin early October. Was there a quote that referenced that precisely? I think there might be some, some clarification on that quote. Um, I, yeah, I, um, he didn't say early October, I can tell you that. Can you tell us what he did say then? Yeah, I, I think I just have to leave it at we're going to meet the government of Iraq's timeline. I, I don't think I could quote it from memory, but I know we didn't say early October. <laughs> okay, appreciate that. And um, can I ask you a question about the Raqqa timeline? Um, I know that this same article suggested that he had delayed, or that he mentioned that because of the current tensions between the Turks uh, and, the, uh, and the SDF forces, that that might force uh, a delay in the uh, and pushing there as well. Uh, were his quotes there uh, accurate as well? Because again, those are not direct quotes in the article, those are paraphrased. Um, you know, Louis, I'm going to have to defer. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I really don't think that I could do that accurately from memory. I don't think it would be my place to try and do that. Um, yeah. To, uh, again, Kind of related to Raqqa, has has the Turkish actions and the SDF's uh, victory in Manbij really accelerated uh, the timelines? Since those are not Iraqi timelines, have they been accelerated inside uh, inside Syria? You you broke up just a bit, Louis. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Has, has the Turkish action along the border, plus the Manbij uh, victory by the SDF, uh, did that in some way accelerate the action inside Syria? It would probably be inappropriate for me to speculate on that. Certainly both of those are positive developments that were extraordinarily helpful. Uh, you know, the way that uh, General McFarland referred to uh, the fall of Manbij was that it's the beginning of the end um, of Daesh presence in northern Syria. So it was key terrain, a very important area. It was a command and control area that they were using for uh, infiltrating and exfiltrating fighters. There have been reams and reams of intelligence data that have come out of there, something like 20 terabytes of intelligence that we're going through. So I think it, uh, you know, the fall of Manbij is going to be a very important thing. And the Turkish involvement there, the, the buffer zone that they've built, uh, the securing of that border, certainly also a very positive development and something that uh, you know, is going to further accelerate the campaign. But, you know, as far as how much, what timeline, I just don't think I, I could give you any uh, estimate on that. Thank you. Okay, and uh, to Andrew Tillman from Military Times. Hi, Colonel. Um, now that General Townsend's been there for a few weeks and uh, with this new influx of troops over the past uh, couple of weeks, you've had, you're now uh, pretty close to the, the force level authorization. Is, is the general uh, considering, how does he feel about the current force level and the current authorities that he, he has? And is he talking to the Iraqis about any uh, additional forces or capabilities that might be needed for uh, the Battle of Mosul? Well, the, the ongoing planning effort that we have with the Iraqis, we speak with them every day and try to figure out how else we can help. Um, if we need any other forces or need anything else that we don't have, then certainly Ge um, General Townsend will be in a position where he can work through channels to ask for that. But uh, at this point, we don't have anything to announce. Uh, no, no, uh, no real developments in this area at all. And certainly something like that would be done through military advice in a military channel and not announced 
at a Pentagon press conference. Uh, next to uh, Richard Sisk of Military.com. Uh, hi, Colonel. Uh, you briefly mentioned the HIMARS system uh, earlier. Has that now moved up to uh, Kiara in, uh, in Iraq? And uh, can you say, uh, can you tell us anything about uh, the reports of the use of the HIMARS uh, last week, I believe, uh, in support of the Turks in Syria? Yeah, the, uh, the HIMARS uh, in Turkey uh, was uh, fired into northern Syria. It was fired against a uh, Daesh safe house, and the target was destroyed. Um, as far as, uh, help me with the, with the first question, Richard. The HIMARS system, has that moved up to uh, Kiara West? As, as far as the location for where those uh, HIMARS are kept, I don't think that I could give you that in the interest of operational security because uh, doing so would just be inappropriate. Uh, uh, the HIMARS did fire um, uh, earlier this week in, in support of the PESH. Did, did you not say that before? Um, I'd have to check. Uh, I'll, I'd have to check uh, our strike releases on that. Uh, Paul Chinkman with U.S. News. Yes, Colonel, uh, good morning. Just to follow up on your response to Louis's question, you said that there are going to be 8 to 12 brigades necessary to liberate Mosul. Can you say how many brigades are currently ready? How many are left to be trained? I think I'm going to have to owe that to you. I can tell you we've got uh, about 6,500 troops in the training pipeline now. Um, I don't have that figure of the number of brigades in, in the training pipeline. Well, to get that, that would be great. And then moving over to the U.S. presidents, can you, uh, presidents, can you say how many TDY troops are in Iraq? Uh, I'm afraid I can't. We don't give out that number. Um, it's a set of business rules that's been in place for about 15 years. By the time I went and researched that number, the number would be different than, than uh, it, you know, by the time I gave it to you, the number would be different than whatever number I was able to get. Um, a lot of those forces are, are uh, special operations forces, and that's why we can't give out that number in the interest of OPSEC. We've seen reports of surges in the number of TDY troops for previous large offensives, like Kiara, for example. Um, with Mosul being the biggest operation that the Iraqi security forces will have had to date, do you anticipate there will be a greater number of TDY troops? It would be inappropriate to speculate. I'm sorry. Just can't help with that one. Yes, just Yep. Are we talking about only ISF kernel, or are you uh, are you included uh, including the uh, the Peshmerga forces as well? Having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Uh, and he's asking you if you're, if you're talking about the, the brigades that you remain to be trained, if they're uh, just ISF, or if those include Pesh as well. The, those include Pesh as well. I don't know if you heard, he, said, he asked you how many of the brigades were Pesh. Two. And uh, Thomas, did you have a follow-up? Other than that, queue is empty. Yeah, Lita, go ahead. Um, John, con considering the amount of interest in the two quotes by Lieutenant General Townsend and the um, Wall Street Journal today, could you take that question, go back, and give us some help here on whether or not we should or should not also report um, that he said the, um, the fight for Mosul would begin in early October. We need some clarification on what he said and or whether what he said is something he's going to clarify or he's backing off of. Or I, I think we, we really need to a little bit of clarification on that, if you can go back and get that for us. Certainly, I'll do so. Okay, last call. Going once, going twice. 
Uh, John, thank you very much for your time. And uh, anything else for us to, to close with? Nope, a lot of good work happening here. Our troops, uh, are they have great morale. They're taking the fight to Daesh, and we really uh, believe that we're going to be successful in helping the Iraqis liberate their country and the Syrians as well. All right. Thank you, everybody.